Hey guys, our friend Marshall Kosloff, he's gonna be conducting interviews with experts and newsmakers for us here on the Breaking Points channel. We're really excited. Yep, here it is. Hey, Breaking Points, Marshall here. I've got a great interview today. I'm speaking with Christopher Mims. He's a technology columnist, the Wall Street Journal. He's also authored Arriving Today, From Factory to Front Door, Why Everything Has Changed, But How and What We Buy. Sagar and I did a really great interview with him uh, a few months back, so definitely check that out on the Realignment Podcast. We're here to talk about a article you put out, Christopher. It's talking about supply chains. Now, we had all these transitions after the big shocks of the China trade war, the COVID crisis, and now Russia sanctions. But let's just start really basically. What are supply chains, and why can we not stop talking about them? So supply chain, you know, the term originated... Uh, in the military because it was just how you kept an army supplied. Of course, in our globalized economy, supply chains are how we get everything that we buy, everything we consume, right? Some supply chains are very short. You know, maybe you buy some carrots at the farmer's market and came from 10 miles away. Most supply chains, especially for finished goods are extremely long. So if you're buying, you know, any gadget, you know, anything at a dollar store, 90% of what you can get at a Walmart, those things are made, you know, in Asia, uh, possibly Mexico, but generally they are crossing an ocean in order to get to you. You know, it's a journey that's tens of thousands of miles long just for the finished product. And if you add up all the other miles of all the components that go into that product, let's say it's a complicated one, like a smartphone, you know, that's a supply chain that can be many tens of thousands of miles long. There's tons of single points of failure because manufacturing has been so concentrated over the years. And so what happens is, you know, if there's a pandemic or anything else, you know, it can take out the entirety of production for advanced microchips, let's say. And then before you know it, that trickles down to um, the fact that now it's impossible to buy a car or you can buy a car, but you, you're going to pay whatever the dealer says you're going to pay. And what's actually going to those? So how are the ways other than just the cars that we're feeling this process where we break down after these three big events? Uh you know, the big one these days, I think, is inflation, honestly. You know, prices are going up because goods are harder to get. Uh, but there are a lot of funny things that have happened along the way. Um, a lot of retailers ordered a lot of products that arrived late this year after the Christmas season. So there's tons of uh, discount retailers um, that are having a bonanza right now because they're selling all these goods that arrived late. You know, the shipping containers were stuck coming into America's ports and, and now they're hitting the beaches, so to speak. There's just tons and tons of idiosyncratic impacts like that. You know, not too long ago, lumber prices shot up because there were big forest fires in British Columbia, but also, you know, mudslides took out the highways for, you know, trucks to move that lumber um, out of Canada. So it just feels like, uh, you know, every week something happens, whether it's a natural disaster or, um, you know, now the COVID lockdowns in China, or uh, you know sanctions against Russia, which are going to take out all kinds of things, which we're going to feel later on, um, that causes you know one shortage or another, whether it's wood or microchips, or uh, you know paint or anything else. Let's just ask the big question: Is globalization over? Globalization is definitely not over, but I think it's the right question to ask. Um, I think the question everybody who is a supply chain professional is trying to answer is how do we continue to leverage what's good about globalization, which is that, you know, when different regions of the world specialize in certain things, it can lead to rapid innovation, right? I mean, uh, TSMC, which is the big microchip manufacturer in Taiwan, you know, they hold the title. They are at the cutting edge, you know, ahead of Samsung and Intel and everybody else because they have concentrated that manufacturing on this one tiny island you know, just 100 miles off the coast of China. Um, what a lot of folks are trying to do now is figure out, can I source goods from a geopolitical ally, for example? Because I think Russia right now is an object lesson and what happens when all of your supply lines get cut. You can't be a modern economy and, and source everything within your own borders, even when you have, you know, 13 time zones in your border and 140 million people, it just can't be done. And the key thing here is you really put on the article, and this is something I think will resonate with Breaking Points viewers, this idea that even companies are questioning these orthodoxies that define how they approach things. So can you actually explain what you mean by that? And like, what are the examples of ideas that really shape this process that companies are now jettisoning? Yeah, so for the last 50 years, what companies have been trying to do is 
how do we just squeeze all the cost out of our supply chain that we possibly can? And so, you know, let's consolidate to one big factory wherever wages are lowest or where that industry is concentrated. So usually somewhere in Asia, you know, whether you're making gadgets or making apparel, you know, if you're Nike, let's say. Um, also, you know, don't carry any extra inventory. You know, just-in-time manufacturing, the definition of that is you don't have any spare parts on hand. You're not carrying any extra inventory for a month from now. You're just making and se you're selling things as soon as you make them and you're buying parts only, you know, a week before you need them. So those orthodoxies have made supply chains efficient, but not robust and not resilient. So what companies are saying now is, let's say your car company, how do I make sure that my suppliers have enough money so that they continue to invest in getting me enough parts when I need them? How do I make sure that I have multiple factories in multiple parts of the world, even though it is extraordinarily difficult to make factory A in Asia and factory B in Mexico produce the exact same object to the same standard of quality? Um, so in that way, you know, we're really upending these orthodoxies that um, made supply chains just as cheap as possible. And a lot of people to really um, treat them as just cost centers. How do we squeeze, you know, every last dollar out of these? Um, you know, that's what America's CFOs have been doing for the past 50 years. You know, it's interesting how much of this is just up to companies and how much is actually up to governments when it comes to whether or not companies take these different approaches? So governments have potentially a big role to play. They have played a bigger role outside of America, especially. I mean, there's this concept that's kind of been like a dirty word in American politics for a long time of industrial policy. So let's choose champion industries and let's subsidize them. So, you know, China has done this forever. That's why they're, they're the world leader in production of solar panels, for example, or, you know, lots of things made out of steel. Uh, South Korea did it, and that's why South Korea owns, you know, the the flat panel display industry. You know, in America, we haven't tended to do that very much, but now um, I think I saw a headline today that the Senate finally passed funding for the so-called CHIPS Act, which means $52 billion in subsidies from the federal government to bring some advanced microchip manufacturing back to the U.S. The U.S. used to make 40% of the world's microchips in 1990. You know, today it's less than 12%. Um, so governments all over the world really are trying to figure out how do we provide incentives for companies and industries to build their manufacturing capacity and even, you know, do things like mine raw materials within our borders. Um, and part of the reason they're doing this is they see it as a national security issue as well. So obviously if a shooting war starts in the South China Sea and that takes out 90% of the world's capacity for advanced microchip manufacturing, that's a problem for the United States and all of its allies. Similarly, uh, you know, if China is the only place that you can get cobalt and nickel and lithium uh, and a trade war happens or there's some other reason you can't get those raw materials, it's going to really hurt all of these car companies that are going all in on electric vehicles because all those are required to make batteries. So unless you want to turn China into the new Saudi Arabia of batteries and, and green energy, then yeah, you might want to think about how do we uh, either subsidize or facilitate or otherwise encourage, um, you know, the nearshoring or the reshoring of the production of certain things to the United States and elsewhere. It's also really big in Europe at this point. Yeah. And it's interesting. Uh, what does this mean for workers? Because when you talk about how 40% of microchips were here, now it's 12%, jobs went somewhere. Are American workers or just any worker in any domestic, are they going to have more jobs given this state of affairs? We already have an incredibly tight labor market. So honestly, one of the big challenges now for companies wanting to do this is, you know, where are they going to get the labor? And, 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 you know, on, on the one hand, um, they can get the labor by training workers and offering higher wages. Um, but uh, it's a challenge because they're competing with, let's say, you know, Amazon that's going to offer you $22 an hour for a warehouse job and a $1,000 signing bonus. So, um, 
you know, the American worker has sort of lost a lot of leverage and the middle class in America really has been hollowed out, depending on what measure you look at since the 1970s. Um, so you could see a continuation of this trend where American workers have more leverage. Mm -hmm. um, I do think long term there is a challenge, though. It's a demographic challenge. So America has really put the brakes on immigration in the past five years. And, you know, frankly, Americans just are not having nearly as many babies as they once did. So it is hard to imagine with a labor market this tight where you're going to get all these extra workers if you were to bring a bunch of manufacturing back, which is one reason why a lot of companies talk instead about near shoring, or I've heard it called ally shoring. Like, how do we make sure that this manufacturing is happening in a country that is close to us? or which, you know, we don't think we're going to lose access to in the event of a trade or an actual war. So this is good for Mexico then. Yeah, it's good for Mexico. It's good for Canada. It's good for Southeast Asia because they're really been pretty great so far countries in that region uh, at being geopolitically neutral and being sort of a provider of choice for everybody, for China and for the U.S. Um, you know, there's other... I think unexpected winners here as well. I mean, I talked to one supply chain expert who told me, you know, I was really looking at where was the next uh, big pool of skilled low cost labor. And he's like, before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, he was really excited about Ukraine. 40 million people, well-educated, you know, labor costs lower than China. He's like, I thought that they were really gonna blow up in manufacturing. Obviously that didn't happen. So there's always these contingencies that you can't account for. And something I'm wondering about, you use the phrase, supply web as opposed to supply chain in terms of what the industry is transforming into. Help us understand what that word means. So, you know, a supply chain implies, uh, you, you just imagine like pearls on a strand or something. It's like, you know, here's where, you know, sand is mined. Here's where it gets turned into silicon, you know, just all one after the other in a linear chain. A supply web means how do we find as many suppliers as possible um, and build factories in different countries, different locations, so that if some if one bit of production gets taken out, you know the uh, manufacturing and the raw materials can be routed through another factory, in order to you know assure that uh, you know business can carry on. I mean, look, this was this the original model of the internet, right? I mean, mm -hmm. ARPANET, which preceded the internet, the whole design was how do we maintain a communications network if some important node gets taken out in a Russian nuclear attack? Oh, let's build a web, you know, eventually a <laughs> World Wide Web. So how do you build that out of out of physical factories and physical links between them, you know, whether it's rail or truck or planes or ships or anything? So two last questions to wrap with. Number one, you really focus on the three big events here. So once again, China trade war, COVID, sanctions. These are, should we understand these events as basically bringing us to a point of no return? AKA there's no world where we just perfectly reopen or let's say Biden or the next administration changes our China trade policy. Let's say the war in Ukraine ends tomorrow and all the things just go away. Is there no going back to the way the world used to be or is there something different coming? Yeah, I mean, I hesitate to be this like Francis Fukuyama, like end of history or the end of the end of history <laughs> type of person because you just never know. But, but I do think that we have really had decades and decades of being in this unusually benign trade environment, unusually benign geopolitical environment. And it really does feel like um, we are m moving toward this state of where there's just more, a, a permanent state of, of increased chaos and difficulty in accessing various markets and shipping goods around. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I think that old normal is is gone. And I think that a new normal where everybody who has to make supply chains work is just constantly recalibrating to try to make them more robust, to try to find new places to make stuff is here. And I think for the American consumer, unfortunately, well, consumers all over the world, in the meantime, there is just going to be a lot of pain in terms of increased prices. Because look, even if you know all of these raw materials were readily available, when you try to reconfigure these supply chains uh, for any reason, it costs money and, and it is a painful transition. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I'm from Portland, Oregon. So when you describe this world, I just think of the dream of the 90s. And the dreams of the 90s, based <laughs> on what you're describing, is, is, basic, is basically gone when it comes to this world we used to come up in. So to wrap this one, 
you describe in the piece and in the book too, all these different ways that we could change things. Like you said, like the ally shoring, not a huge fan of that one. I think there's some work to be done on the branding side here. Need Thomas Friedman to get on that. But basically ally shoring, spreading out, diversifying, keeping things at hand. How much can those things reduce pain? Or is there basically nothing that could be done to make things perfectly optimal ever again? I mean, the good news is that like our material civilization is not falling apart. Like there, the, the global supply chains have shown incredible resilience and adaptability in the face of, you know, let's not forget a global pandemic and all the shutdowns that came with that. So, you know, the good news is like things will still work. They are just going to be more expensive and we are going to consume less of all that we collectively um, you know, and it's going to slow down the economy. Um, but, you know, we're still in a world that is in some ways leaps and bounds better than what we had, you know, decades ago where y- y- you just didn't have access to world markets. Like we're still going to have that access. It's just everything's going to cost more and be harder. Good way to put it. So Christopher, we'd love for you to shout out the book. There's a bunch of copies in the back, but uh, yeah, just shout out the book. <laughs> Yeah, so the book is called Arriving Today. It's about how everything gets from the factory to the front door. Um, also, if you don't have the patience for a 300-page book, it's also now a documentary on YouTube and on WSJ.com called um, Chain Reaction. It's this hour-long documentary. We sent producers all over the world, and it gives you a really good visual feeling and I think a sense of empathy for the workers involved in these supply chains um, that you know I couldn't even capture in a book. So you know, go check out the documentary to start with. It's Chain Reaction and uh, it's on WSJ.com and on YouTube. That's awesome. We'll put that in the description. So if you want to check out the documentary and also Wall Street Journal products, normally paywalls. So this is a huge opportunity for everyone. Yeah, and check out free. the description right below. This is huge. Christopher, thank you for joining us on Breaking Points. Yeah, Marshall, thank you so much for having me. Hey guys, we're gonna be totally upfront with you. This is the most perilous time that we have ever operated in. It is so difficult just to try to sort through the news, but even more importantly, to bring you accurate information as this wave of lockdown and censorship spreads across the nation. Yeah, look, if you can become a premium subscriber today at breakingpoints.com, you're gonna help us build out a vibrant, independent media ecosystem, which is free of mainstream pressure. We can't tell you how important that is at a time like this. Yep, that's right. Go to breakingpoints.com to subscribe. We love you guys and we appreciate you so much.